Had he lived today, he might have been a photographer. He probably would have liked capturing people at spontaneous moments, just when their gesture or expression reflected the exact mood or personality he saw. He might have been a news photographer, snapping away while people and events made history and trying to capture the drama of the event. He could even have been a filmmaker. Some of his pictures look like a single frame from an action-filled movie or a melodrama. But as it was, he was a painter, the greatest of all the Dutch masters, Rembrandt van Rijn. Today we know him just as Rembrandt. He's famous now, as he was in his own time, for the human qualities of his paintings. Before Rembrandt, pictures, and especially portraits, were rather formal and stiff. The subject sat or stood in contrived poses and looked out with impassive faces that revealed nothing. Rembrandt is considered great because he brought humanity to his work. In other words, he made his subjects human. They have expressions, feelings, and attitudes. They look inquisitive or jolly or startled or sly. They look real. Rembrandt's people are more than faces and bodies plopped down in a false setting. They are alive with emotion and thought. This was true even when Rembrandt painted group scenes or events. Before Rembrandt, artists lined up their subjects and painted them all pretty much in the same pose, with the same expression, like a school picture. But Rembrandt's people interact and respond to each other in ways that show they're all individuals with different reactions to the same event. Some of his pictures are so animated you can almost hear the people talking. It makes his pictures not only interesting, but fun to study. People can get immersed in a Rembrandt scene for a long time. They have that special quality that today we would call human interest. Rembrandt's pictures are also known for the imaginative way he used light. He liked to contrast dark and light, sometimes painting the background dark and then the faces of the people bright, as if they were in a spotlight. The effect was very dramatic and sometimes mystical. Unlike many great artists, such as Van Gogh, Rembrandt's style and imagination were appreciated in his own time, and he had a successful and lucrative career. But he also experienced much sadness and, later in life, the disappointment of watching his success fade. Like his paintings, Rembrandt's life was a contrast in light and dark. He went through periods of joy and abundance and periods of grief and scarcity. His life was a reversal of most great lives. He started out well and achieved early acclaim and then he gradually declined. He was rediscovered centuries later and now is permanently established as one of the greatest geniuses in the history of painting. Rembrandt was born on July 15, 1606, in the city of Leiden in Holland. It was the year Shakespeare wrote Antony and Cleopatra, the year Galileo invented a new compass, and the year the British sent out a shipload of colonists to start its first settlement in America at Jamestown, Virginia. Rembrandt was born at a time when Holland was filled with hope and celebration. It was coming to the end of its long struggle to gain independence from Catholic Spain, and it was well on its way to becoming a world power. Soon the new republic would be trading with China and Japan, building settlements in India, seizing the Spice Islands from the Portuguese, and establishing colonies in America. It was a time of growth, expansion, and prosperity. In times like those, there is almost always rapid development in the arts. Rembrandt was born not just at the right time in Holland, but in the right place. Leiden was a stimulating city, home of the first Protestant university in the Netherlands, and a center of arts and learning. The Van Rijn family was a large one. Rembrandt was the eighth of nine children, although only four had survived. Rembrandt would break a long tradition in his family. For five generations, the men had been millers, even their name, Rhine, had been taken from the name of their mill. Rembrandt's mother was the daughter of a baker and a devoutly pious woman. When Rembrandt was seven, he enrolled at the Latin school in Leiden, where he learned not just Latin, but religion, history, and the classics. All that history and religion at home and at school would appear later in his paintings. By the time he was a teenager, it was clear Rembrandt had artistic skills. His father had planned that he'd become a clergyman or a magistrate, but like many parents of great people, he had to sacrifice his own plans when the remarkable talents of his child began to emerge. He sent Rembrandt to the University of Leiden, but then withdrew him when he saw the technical skill of his drawings. 
Rembrandt then began a three-year apprenticeship under a local painter named Jacob van Swanenberg. His studies were over, his craft had now begun. Swanenberg was an obscure painter with no exceptional talent, but he taught Rembrandt the basic techniques of painting that provided the foundation for greater learning. That greater learning took another leap when Rembrandt moved to Amsterdam, now a major capital of Europe. He joined the studio of Peter Lastman, a painter with some fame for his historical scenes and a style he'd picked up from Italian painters. Lastman encouraged Rembrandt in the direction of historical and biblical scenes. He also taught him to use lofty subjects, to pay careful attention to ancient costumes, and to paint group scenes of full-length subjects. Rembrandt was a quick study. What emerged right away was his skill at painting facial expressions and his focus on the inner world of his subjects, rather than the outer world of the scene itself. In six months, he learned all he could from Lastman. He headed back to Leiden to launch his own career. In Rembrandt's time, most serious young painters made a pilgrimage to Italy to study the works of the great Renaissance masters. But Rembrandt wasn't interested. When a friend asked him why not, he said there were plenty of Italian pictures at home he could see. And home is where he stayed. For his whole life, Rembrandt remained in Holland, finding his inspiration in his own familiar surroundings and using his friends and family as his subjects. Back in Leiden, Rembrandt himself became a teacher, though he was only in his early twenties. He brought his students into his studio where they assisted him on his own paintings. There he painted a steady stream of portraits and scenes from history, mythology, and the Bible. The titles of his early works give a good idea of the types of subjects he was choosing. Titles like Stoning of St. Stephen, Capture of Samson, Judas Returning the Thirty Pieces of Silver, Andromeda, Raising of Lazarus, Pluto and Proserpina, and Raising of the Cross. Besides his painting, Rembrandt drew and etched constantly. His etchings are superb and as valuable to collectors as some of his paintings. He produced 300 etchings in his lifetime, and perhaps as many as 2,000 drawings, most of which he kept in a private album. He was still only in his twenties, and Rembrandt was already an established artist with a steady income. There was a new upper class in Holland, made wealthy by its successes in commerce and the banking industry. These nouveau riches aspired to live like the nobility, and were anxious to fill their luxurious homes with elegant paintings and artworks. Rembrandt's commissions kept coming and coming. He painted for local citizens, for trade groups and civic organizations, and even for the Prince of Orange, the most powerful man in Holland. A self-portrait of Rembrandt at this time shows him decked out in fur and velvet, a large beret perched jauntily atop his head, his manner as elegant and distinguished as an aristocrat. When he was twenty-five, Rembrandt moved to the center of all the action in Holland, Amsterdam, he stayed with a wealthy art dealer named Hendrik van Uhlenberg and helped run his studio while also taking portrait commissions. One of those commissions led to the completion of one of his most famous masterpieces. The commission was from the Surgeons Guild. They asked for a portrait of the chief surgeon of Amsterdam, Dr. Nicholas Tulp, surrounded by his students. The result was the anatomy lesson of Dr. Tulp, a painting that almost overnight made Rembrandt the leading portrait painter of the Netherlands. Suddenly, all the city leaders of Amsterdam were clamoring to have their portraits painted by Rembrandt van Rijn. Since Amsterdam was now a Protestant republic, it had no kings or cardinals to finance its artists, but it had a new class of wealthy merchants. Besides these people, the trade and craft associations or guilds and certain military companies commissioned pictures. In only his first four years in Amsterdam, Rembrandt received fifty portrait commissions, most of them well paid. He soon became rich and was welcomed into the brilliant social life of Amsterdam's reigning upper class. The style Rembrandt was developing made use of what is called chiaroscuro, an art term that describes the dramatic contrast and interplay of light and dark, light and shadow. Rembrandt was a master at it, and he was becoming more and more skilled at portraying the subtle inner emotions of his subjects, prompting a famous poet of the time to write, That's right, Rembrandt, paint Cornelius's voice. His visible self is second choice. Two years later, after the anatomy lesson of Dr. Tulp, when Rembrandt was twenty-four, he fell in love with Saskia von Uhlenberg, cousin of his art dealer friend, Hendrik Uhlenberg. She was the daughter of a wealthy and eminent citizen 
who served as burgomaster, the Dutch version of a mayor. Rembrandt was moving up in the world. The couple bought a large house in the fashionable Jewish section of Amsterdam, a popular area for artists. Rembrandt had an affinity with Jewish people. He admired their culture and their history, took much of his inspiration from their Old Testament, and liked to use Jewish citizens as his models. One of his best-known paintings is called The Jewish Bride. In his newly wed days, Rembrandt, perhaps feeling romantic and content, began to paint quieter scenes and landscapes. Like most artists in love, he used his lover as a model for much of his work. Again, the titles tell it all. Saskia as Flora, Saskia in profile, Rembrandt and Saskia as the prodigal son, and self-portrait with Saskia. Rembrandt painted and drew self-portraits throughout his life. They're a living document of the passage of time and its effect on his face and character. In all, Rembrandt painted nearly 100 self-portraits that reveal his artistic growth and remarkable self-awareness. During the happy days of his marriage to Saskia, his self-portraits radiate confidence and prosperity. Rembrandt attracted many students while he was living in Amsterdam, and more than 20 of them became well-known artists in their own right. Later, a few would become more popular with the Dutch than Rembrandt himself, a circumstance that caused him much pain and bitterness. Rembrandt not only made paintings, he collected them. He enjoyed the work of other artists and frequently added to his collection. He had other kinds of collections too, shells and coral, antique statues, oriental items and weapons. He had, in a sense, his own personal museum. He also liked to collect foreign costumes and furs, which he draped over his models when they posed for portraits. Rembrandt's years with Saskia were happy ones. He was a sociable fellow and played host to other artists, scholars, writers, and preachers from his lovely house on Jodenbristraat. Saskia gave birth to four children, but only one survived. That was their son Titus, who would also serve as a favorite model for Rembrandt's paintings. Rembrandt's painting, Saskia in Bed, is believed by some to portray her after the loss of one of her infants. The deaths of his children hit Rembrandt hard. He liked children and hoped for a large family. With the loss of each child, he grew a little sadder, a little more subdued. Then in 1642, when he was 36 and his son Titus was just a year old, Saskia too died. She was only 30. Rembrandt retreated into a quiet, private life where he could nurse his grief. 1642 was a desperately low point personally, but as sometimes happens, it was a high point professionally. Like the chiaroscuro of his paintings, the background of his life was dark, but there were spots of light in the foreground. For the year Saskia died was also the year of Rembrandt's greatest artistic achievement, the painting known as Night Watch. It was a glorious painting, and the one today for which he's most admired. But at the time, people didn't like it. They found its dramatic contrast of darkness and light too extreme. It was his greatest work, and it also signaled the beginning of his decline. The artistic taste of the Dutch people began to change in the mid-1660s. They gradually began to prefer the lighter style of other painters over Rembrandt's realism and strong use of chiaroscuro. Rembrandt refused to modify his style to suit public demand. He remained faithful to his own vision throughout his life. As a result, his last masterpiece, The Conspiracy of Julius Civilis, which had been commissioned by the city council, was rejected altogether. Following Night Watch, Rembrandt, still in mourning for Saskia, remained in semi-seclusion and produced only a few paintings. As his spirits declined, so did his fortune. Commissions were becoming rare, and the expenses of his grand house had become a burden. To add to his problems, Saskia's relatives were making inquiries into how he'd handle her estate. Then, after an ill-advised affair with his son's nurse, he was sued by her for breach of promise. The suit dragged on for years until Rembrandt finally made a cash settlement. The nurse was later committed to a reformatory and died soon after. Seven years after Saskia's death, Rembrandt realized he needed a stable influence in his home, and his son Titus needed a loving caregiver. He hired a woman named Hendrikie Stoffels to move in and watch over the boy. Eventually, she became Rembrandt's common-law wife, and like Saskia, the subject of many of his paintings. Woman bathing is among the most famous of these. In 1654, when Rembrandt was 48, Hendrikie gave birth to a daughter, whom they named Cornelia. Just before the birth, Hendrikie had been officially censured by the church council for living in sin. 
It's not clear why Rembrandt never married her, but it may have had something to do with his complicated financial situation. By this time, Rembrandt had some serious money problems. He was never a good manager, and his large house had been a financial stretch to start with. The mortgage on it had been huge. Now, with commissions tapering off, debts were accumulating, and he could no longer afford the house. Rembrandt declared bankruptcy. The great house and all its furnishings were confiscated by the city of Amsterdam to pay Rembrandt's creditors. His most valuable and cherished possessions were auctioned off to the public, and he moved to a smaller house. Later, he would paint a portrait of the auctioneer. Even though he'd paired his expenses considerably, there were still debts. Rembrandt was unable to keep up a large workshop that would allow him to take in students. Hendricky and Titus, now a young man, tried to help by setting up an art shop in their own names. That way they could hire Rembrandt and protect him from his creditors. During all this adversity, Rembrandt continued to work, using his family as models. But he withdrew from society and never really returned. His work mirrored the changes that hardship had brought. It was calmer, more subdued, and contemplative. His self-portraits reflected a sadness around the eyes and mouth. Although Rembrandt would receive important commissions until the end of his life, from here on in he was painting mostly to please himself. His works became more thoughtful and tender. Activity gave way to introspection. In his religious paintings, Christ looked especially compassionate. Rembrandt's material and personal losses had enriched his art. In these later years of life, Rembrandt watched while a younger generation of painters rose to take his place in Dutch society. Many of these painters were his own former students. Rembrandt became bitter and more and more isolated. Yet the isolation may have served a purpose. It allowed him more freedom and the quiet in which to pursue his own ever-developing style. In the middle of all his despair and loss, there was one bit of good fortune. A Sicilian nobleman who collected works of the greatest artists of the day asked Rembrandt to make a painting for him. It's one reason we know that Rembrandt's fame in his time had spread at least as far as Italy, and perhaps farther. The nobleman knew only that he wanted a picture of a philosopher. Which philosopher was up to Rembrandt? Rembrandt came up with the imaginative idea of painting the world's greatest philosopher thinking about the world's greatest poet. The piece is called Aristotle Contemplating a Bust of Homer. As the years passed, Rembrandt's luck improved and his income began to increase again. The last decade of his life produced a large number of self-portraits. The final one, painted the year he died, shows a firm, penetrating gaze amid aged, sagging flesh. The spirit still shone from within. When Rembrandt was fifty-seven, Hendricky died, and he was a grieving widower once more. Only five years later, his son Titus, who had just married, also died, at the age of only twenty-seven. His daughter Cornelia, still living at home, became his only surviving child. Even his young daughter-in-law, Titus's widow, died before Rembrandt did. After Titus's death, Rembrandt never fully recovered. He died the following year, 1669, at the age of sixty-three. Rembrandt is buried at a church in Amsterdam, but it's not his grave that fans usually visit in Amsterdam. It's the grand old house he loved so much and lost to the creditors. It's now the Rijex Museum, a public museum of his works that attracts thousands of tourists every day of the year. Before Rembrandt died, he had managed to stabilize his finances again and leave an inheritance to his remaining family. But he died in obscurity, almost completely forgotten by the Dutch public. The 18th century rediscovered him and his reputation grew and grew until by the 20th century he was regarded as a giant in the history of art. His name is now universally synonymous with Dutch painting. Rembrandt created over 600 paintings in a period of a little over 40 years. Of those 600, the ones that are now most popular are his self-portraits, which define that genre for the future, and his three masterpieces, The Anatomy Lesson of Dr. Tulp, Night Watch, and Aristotle Contemplating the Bust of Homer. The picture that first made him famous was The Anatomy Lesson of Dr. Tulp in 1632, when Rembrandt was 26 years old. It's a group portrait that's unlike other group portraits of the time, because it's so full of movement and personality. In the middle of the portrait, on a table, is the cadaver of a man hanged for robbery. Dr. Tulp is dissecting it and explaining the anatomy of the hand to his students. Tulp has a very serious and academic demeanor, as would be expected. 
Three of his students lean forward over the table in deep fascination. Another refers to his notes and looks even slightly puzzled. Still another looks across the room at a large medical book propped on a lectern. A student to the left listens attentively. A student in the back looks off into the distance as if he's trying to visualize what he's hearing. Everywhere there is reaction, involvement, and emotion. Only the cadaver, pale and waxen against the dark background, is unresponsive. Looking at the painting, you almost feel as if you're peeking into the classroom for a moment and should quietly sneak away before you're discovered. The Night Watch is both the most famous and the largest of all of Rembrandt's paintings. Its real name is The Company of Captain Franz Banning Koch and Lieutenant William Van Reutenkern. So it's understandable that people later tried to give it a nickname. That nickname, unfortunately, turned out to be somewhat misguided. When the picture was cleaned and the dark residue of many years removed, it was found that, lo and behold, the scene didn't take place at night at all. It was a daytime scene. What people had thought were the dark, somber tones of Rembrandt's palette was just a lot of grime concealing much lighter tones. The Night Watch, or the Day Watch as it should be called, was painted when Rembrandt was 36 years old. It's four and a half by five meters long roughly the equivalent of five by five and a half yards. It was commissioned by a group of civic guards who wanted their service to the state immortalized. Little did they dream just how famous and enduring their portraits would indeed become. In a very unique arrangement, each soldier in the picture paid Rembrandt his share of the cost of the painting. Once again, Rembrandt broke the rules of previous portrait painters and didn't paint his subjects in stationary poses. No neat, disciplined soldiers lined up in strict military fashion for Rembrandt. These soldiers are on the move. The painting shows them at the moment they're heading out on an armed march, even though in real life these men never fought in battle. They had only a social function. Rembrandt's intent was to capture the heroic role such regiments played in earlier times. Night Watch vibrates with energy. The captain's in front with his hand outstretched to lead the way. The lieutenant steps forward, lance in hand. Some men are cleaning their muskets. Another wraps out a marching beat on a drum. Still others whisper and comment to each other. There isn't one subject in the enormous painting who isn't gesturing or moving or wearing an animated expression. Rembrandt's use of light and shadow in Night Watch is also fascinating. Parts of the picture glow and radiate bright light. Others linger in shadows. Some faces are lit up and others blend into the dark background. The contrast between light and dark is part of what makes the picture so dramatic. Rembrandt had a special ability to use light in such a way that ordinary people look mysterious and awesome. The entire piece reflects Rembrandt's originality and mastery. This painting is now the main attraction of the Rijk Museum in Amsterdam. Though badly received when it was painted, it has more than redeemed itself. Aristotle contemplating the bust of Homer, painted when he was 47, is one of Rembrandt's big hits with the public, probably because of its concept as much as its technique. It's an intriguing idea to think about a philosopher who influenced history for centuries to come, contemplating a poet who has so greatly influenced him and his entire generation. What we're seeing is our noble past contemplating its noble past. The painting works wonders with the imagination. Even though Homer is just a stone figure in the picture, there seems to be an exchange of affection and respect between the two men. And the expression on Aristotle's face is so profound and poignant, it's easy to project all kinds of thoughts and emotions on him. This is perhaps the greatest gift of Rembrandt's work. It involves the viewer, pulls us into a dialogue with it, and makes us feel a part of the action. Rembrandt was a great storyteller. There is always something happening in a Rembrandt picture, even if it's happening internally. He used his mastery of light and shadow to make these stories as dramatic and powerful as possible. It's as difficult to walk away from some of Rembrandt's paintings as it is to walk away in the middle of a good movie or to put down a half-finished novel. Unlike many artists, Rembrandt wrote nothing about his art. He never took the time or had the interest to describe his creative processes or goals. There is only one indication of what Rembrandt hoped to achieve, written by him in a letter to the Prince of Orange. In that letter, he said he was committed to evoking the greatest and most natural emotion for his subjects. It was not something he even needed to say, for his work speaks for itself. Rembrandt's paintings tell us many things about him. 
They tell us most of all that he was sympathetic and insightful about human nature. His paintings are unsurpassed in their portrayal of human emotions. They express a range of emotions and moods that feel palpable and real. He was far ahead of his times in his sensitivity and awareness of human psychology. The universal appeal of Rembrandt's work will always be in its humanity. As Rembrandt's own experience of life became richer and deeper, even through suffering and loss, his sense of humanity only became more refined and more profound. Just as the darkness in his pictures was essential to emphasize the light, so was the darkness in his own life essential to his light of knowing.